Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. This is the fourth video in the playlist covering inflammation and immunology. If you missed the previous videos in this section, you can click on the Stomp on Step 1 logo here to be brought to a list of all of the videos in this section. We will start with the complement system, which you'll see in the top right corner. I give a high yield rating of 4. For those of you that aren't familiar with the high yield rating, it's a scale from 0 to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE Step 1 exam. And if you'd like to learn more about how the high yield rating is calculated or how to interpret it, you can click this orange box here. Complement is a system of circulating proteins which augment or complement the actions of phagocytes and antibodies during the immune response. Complement is important in acute and chronic inflammation. The complement system involves a complicated activation cascade, but you don't really need to know all the specifics of that system for step one. The classic picture of this system involves C1 being activated first, and then active C1 goes on to activate C2, and so on until you get through C9. However, there are some other mechanisms where you can sort of start in the middle of this process and not necessarily start with C1, but again, it's not super important to memorize all the different ways this cascade can be triggered. What's really important for step one is the end products of the complement cascade and how it causes the end results of what it's going to do. I will try to show you the simplified version of this with this slide. So we've got a pathogen here. It could be a bacteria, a virus infected cell, fungus, whatever. And I'll start here with an antibody binding to the pathogen. So this is part of chronic inflammation, immunology from the B cells. This isn't part of complement yet. But now this antibody is going to interact with the C1 protein. And when the C1 protein binds to the antibody, which is already bound to the pathogen, it's going to activate C1 and therefore activate the complement cascade. As we head through those proteins, C1 through C9, activating them all, you're gonna have three main end results from that. One of them is going to be the activation of C3B. C3B opsonizes the pathogens, which basically means that it tags the pathogen so that phagocytes can find the pathogen easier. So you can see that here, that when C1's activated, it will eventually lead to the activation of C3B through multiple steps, which is going to make the phagocyte have an easier time finding the pathogen. Another end result of the complement cascade is the creation of active C5A. And C5A is a chemotactic factor, which means it attracts neutrophils. This is similar to IL-8 and LTB4. The last main result of the complement cascade is going to be the formation of MAC, or membrane attack complex. This complex is formed through a combination of activated C5 through C9. And the MAC forms a hole in the membrane of the bacteria, which causes lysis, or bursting open, of the pathogen. Here is the text version of the slide I just covered. C C1 binds antibodies, start in cascade. C3B opsonizes the pathogen, tags it so phagocytes can find it easier. C5A attracts neutrophils by being a chemotactic factor and then MAC is going to form holes in the membrane of bacteria to cause lysis. There are two main types of extracellular fluid buildup, or edema. Being able to distinguish between the two may help you figure out what is causing the fluid to build up in the specific tissue. For example, when you're trying to figure out what is causing a pleural fusion, the fluid makeup helps you determine the cause. Both transidate and exudate are made up of fluid that travels from within the vessel into the tissue. However, the exact mechanism of this fluid buildup is going to be different for both of them. Transidates are caused by disturbances of hydrostatic forces like 
increased blood pressure in the vessel or decreased oncotic pressure in the vessel, which is most often going to be caused by having less protein in the blood. Exudates are caused by inflammatory processes where post-capillary venules open, resulting in leukocytes, plasma proteins, and fluid traveling from inside the vessel into the tissue. These cells and proteins give exudate a cloudy color and a higher density, especially when compared to transudates, because transudates are primarily water. You can see here in the graph that transudate is primarily pure fluid. Exudate is going to be that same fluid plus the proteins and the leukocytes. The fluid alone is going to be pretty clear. The exudate is going to be just a tad cloudy. And then we'll talk about the specific gravity in a couple slides here. Here's my uh, dumb mnemonic for remembering this. Transidate is caused by differences in pressure on opposite sides of the vessel. That's because trans in biochem and orgochem represent opposite, so that should be pretty easy to remember. And then exudate has extra stuff in it. That's going to be the cells, proteins, etc. that go along with the fluid. So with those two things in mind, you should be able to work backwards and figure out everything you need to know. Now we can double back and talk about specific gravity. Specific gravity is calculated by taking the density of the fluid being tested, then dividing that by the density of water. So it's just a ratio. Therefore, it makes sense that transidate, which is almost pure water, would have a density that's very close to water. And it does. It has a density that's within 1% of water. So transidate has a specific gravity of 1.01 or less. The extra cells and proteins present in exudate mean it has a higher density than water. And it generally has a density that's at least 2% higher than water. So it's going to have a minimum specific gravity of 1.02 and up. After acute inflammation has finished removing the noxious stimuli, the macrophages trigger a healing phase by releasing certain cytokine signals. For tissues like skin or liver that can undergo hyperplasia easily, the damaged tissue can be replaced by fully functional tissue. The tissue just makes new cells and it's almost like the injury never happened. However, most tissues lack the ability to undergo hyperplasia that easily. And instead, what you're going to have is the tissue will be replaced by a non-functional scar during the healing process. The process of scar formation proceeds through two distinct steps. The first step along scar formation is going to be the formation of granulation tissue. This is a weak, temporary connective tissue scar that begins forming within a couple days of the injury. It's going to be characterized by angiogenesis, aka vessel formation, fibroblasts depositing type 3 collagen, and myofibroblasts, which are fibroblasts with smooth muscle properties that contract the wound. Granulation tissue usually has a bright red color to it and a moist appearance, and this is because all of the angiogenesis is bringing a lot of blood to the area. Over time, the granulation tissue will convert into mature scar, and when it's done, scar is going to be a permanent fibrotic healing that begins about a week after injury. Fibroblasts replace randomly weaved type 3 collagen in granulation tissue with the stronger, more organized, and cross-linked type 1 collagen to give you the scar. As is the case with most body processes, the formation of a scar can have some problems, and that will lead to a hypertrophic scar. This is when you lay down too much collagen during scar formation. As a result, the scar can be raised above the level of the rest of the organ and is usually a different color. Sometimes this can be caused by infection during the healing process, uh, lack of stitches if it's skin, or some other problem during scar formation. A keloid is an extreme version of a hypertrophic scar where the collagen mass can spread outside the site of injury. Keloids be can become cancerous and can be the result of even very small injuries. The classic picture is somebody who gets their ear pierced and then before long has a large mass kind of dangling off their ear. And you can see a an example of that here. 
the cause of keloids is not well understood. Scar formation in the central nervous system and brain are a little bit different than the rest of the body. Gliosis or astrocytosis is the way that healing takes place in the CNS following injuries like a stroke. It involves proliferation of glial cells, mainly astrocytes, to form a non-functional scar at the site of injury. In this case, astrocytes will fill the injured area with intermediate filaments and extracellular matrix that is non-functional brain tissue. Now we can move on to granulomas. When the body recognizes when the body recognizes a material as foreign, but can't eliminate it with any type of inflammation, it creates a circular wall of collagen and inflammatory cells around the material. This wall prevents the material from spreading and causing damage, even though the body cannot figure out a way to destroy the noxious stimuli. Patients that have the ability to create these walled off areas can remain asymptomatic even though they are infected with foreign material because this noxious material is quarantined. It's not gone, it's still in the body, but it's walled off so it really can't do anything. This circular walled off area is called a granuloma. On step one, you need to be able to identify a granuloma by a pathology picture or its description in words. We'll start with the text description. The buzzwords for a granuloma are going to be epithelioid histiocytes and multinucleated giant cells or Langerhans cells. These are all specific types of macrophages that result after the exposure to interferon gamma, which is going to be released by CD4 T cells. And these are the characteristic cells for granulomas multinucleated giant cells are going to be formed by the combination of multiple macrophages and epithelioid histiocytes are macrophages that change in their appearance to almost look like epithelial cells. So those are the buzz terms you need to remember in text. You also need to be able to pick it out in a picture. Here's a classic picture of a granuloma. You're going to have a very circular shape and the rim of that circular shape is going to have lots of dark purple inflammatory cells. Those inflammatory cells are going to be the epithelioid histiocytes and leukocytes. In the middle of the circular area, sometimes you'll have cases necrosis and other times you will not. Granulomas can result from a lot of different diseases and infections, so it isn't a super specific finding in any sort of question stem. But when you do see either the presence of granulomas or some sort of buzzword to make you think granulomas in a question sim, you should be starting to think of the few most common presenting conditions listed here. Tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, Wegener's granulomatosis, chronic granulomatous disease, and fungal infections are the most common conditions that are going to have questions related to the presence of granulomas. That brings us to the end of this video. If you liked this video and would like to see more, please click on the orange subscribe button here. It will make it easier for you to find other videos from my channel, and it helps me out a lot. In the next video in the inflammation and immunology section, we're going to start with the immunology topics. This next video is going to have an introduction to the immunology material as well as going to some details about B and T cell development and B and T cell activation. So things like clonal deletion, peripheral tolerance, major histocompatibility complexes, etc. So I do hope you will click on this black box here to be brought to that video. Thank you so much for watching and good luck with your studying.